This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth kicks off today's show as he talks about how chinch bugs could be impacting farmers' fields right now. Continuing the show is K-State wheat pathologist Kelsey Anderson Onofrey explaining what concerns wheat growers could be seeing in their field as they harvest and if it could impact them at the elevator. June is dairy month and that typically means hosting events at the farm. However, with the current HPAI situation, producers will probably want to avoid bringing large groups onto the farm. K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook ends today's show by offering some ideas for safely celebrating Dairy Month. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Tuesday show talking about chinch bugs with K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Anytime. Jeff, you've been receiving lots of questions about chinch bugs once again. Yes. You know, chinch bugs are a perennial problem in Kansas in a grass, any kind of a grass. They feed on any grass, brome, turf, any kind of grass. But in agriculture, where we usually have a problem with chinch bugs is in sorghum, especially corn occasionally, rarely wheat, but those are three crops that are in the grass family also. So chinch bugs can utilize them as a food source. Last year in 2023, if you all recall, we had major infestations of chinch bugs probably all across the eastern two-thirds of the state. The densities that we saw last year probably we hadn't seen for oh, seven or eight years. Chinch bugs are a perennial problem, not an every year problem. And generally, that's probably because of the weather. Remember, weather allows insect populations to rapidly progress their development or slow down their development or whether it just allows their populations to exist, basically. Last year, if you recall, we had dry conditions early on and chinch bugs and grasshoppers, for that matter, generally seem to do better in dry conditions. I don't know why that is. I know there's some fungal pathogens that actually will help reduce chinch bug populations and other insect pest populations. But I didn't see any, I haven't really seen any in chinch bugs for the last 10 years. Prior to that, we'd see a fungus and that is indicated by the white, the chinch bug's body will be all white or the same fungus gets on green clover worms and soybeans lots of times. Uh, You'll notice that more readily than you do on the chinch bugs. But I haven't really noticed the, the fungus probably for about 10 years, so I'm not sure why we haven't had the chinch bug populations until last year. And last year, 2023, they seem to explode. Now, when I say we haven't had chinch bug populations, every year, you know, some part of the state, there'll be a little area that has quite a few. But the, what we saw last year, the over the majority of the state, if you recall, it was dry early and it was warm. And that does seem to, you know, aid chinch bug populations in their development and their reproductive capacity. And there really aren't any predators or other natural enemies of chinch bugs that are going to help us. So basically, it's the weather. What about for this year? This year, we went into 2023 into the winter with massive populations of potentially overwintering chinch bugs and just because of the populations we saw last year. So there's no way to tell what populations are going to come out successfully from the winter. Um, the Kansas Department of Agriculture used to run an overwintering survey, and they would sample several different places around the state every year, the same places, in the grasses, the type of areas that chinch bugs overwinter in. They would sample those, bring them into K-State, uh, into our labs, and we would count the overwintering survivors. And then we would try and correlate that with the nearby crop fields where we picked up the samples from the overwintering, we never could correlate it. You know, some years there'd be a really high survivorship in one area, no infestations in the spring. So the KDA, the Kansas Department of Agriculture, gave that up just because we couldn't correlate it. So that's why I'm saying we went into the into the fall or the winter with huge populations of potentially overwintering chinch bugs. How they fare coming out this spring, I don't know. But the weather seems to be very conducive to their survival. You know, we didn't have that bad of winter conditions. Uh, It's been dry pretty much and warm pretty much uh, this spring. Now, we have been getting some rains lately. 
So that might help. But that brings up another question. Do the rains help? And, you know, they help the crops. For dang sure, if the crops are stressed with moisture, if they get a little bit of chinch bug feeding on them, it's going to be more detrimental to the crop than it would if it's good growing conditions. So that's part of it. And I, I do have gotten a couple of questions. Folks have gotten large rains. Uh, they want to know if that's going to drown the chinch bugs. It's not. Chinch bugs, I've never seen them drown. They float. So if you get a big rain and all that water runs off to one part of your field, you can bet you're going to have a lot of chinch bugs, you know, in that one part of the field because it's it's kind of like uh, detritus or driftwood, you know, where the where the water takes it all. There's a big pile of it. Same with chinch bugs. They're going to be in that area. What crops are the chinch bugs currently in? Right now they're in the wheat, but they're starting to come out of the wheat. The wheat is senescing or turning or maturing or turning yellow or golden very quickly. I mean, from last week to this week, it, it is really moving along. So the chinch bugs are going to start moving out of the wheat. That's their normal source of food early on. They've been sucking the juice out of the plant. Um, so they're moving out, and that's where we get in trouble, where we plant sorghum or corn adjacent to an infested wheat field. Generally, it's sorghum that's more severely attacked just because of the right now the sorghum's smaller or it or hasn't even been planted yet, uh, which is good. If you haven't planted your sorghum yet, and you can hold off for another week or two till this what we call the walking migration of chinch bugs. They can't fly. They just have to walk. So once they've walked out of the wheat, if they don't find a good source of food, some kind of other grass, they will just die. And it doesn't take very long. They, The newly emerged chinch bug nymphs can last maybe, well, we've kept them for four or five days, and they just die on their own if they can't find sustenance. They can't find another grass crop to start sucking the juice out of. Now, volunteer wheat will suffice. If you've got a bunch of volunteer wheat, that will also. But if you can hold off planting your sorghum for another week or two, uh, that would be ideal. Then I don't think you will have a big problem with the walking generation of chinch bugs. Are there other questions you get when it comes to trying to control chinch bugs? The other question I always get is, what about insecticide seed treatments on sorghum? Those work, okay? They work really well. They'll kill the chinch bugs. The problem with those, the chinch bug has to actually suck a little bit of the juice out of the germinating plant or the seedling in order to get the toxin. And if there's enough chinch bugs coming out of the of the wheat, they can actually overcome the plant, kill the plant, even though that toxin will kill the chinch bugs. We've seen in our uh, previous trials, we've seen plants just furry, with dead chinch bugs and their little uh, proboscis of their beaks are stuck in the plant and it kills them, but it also killed the plant. So you got to keep that in mind. That'll still help. It'll keep, it'll kill them so they won't destroy as much of the field as they march across it as they would if it wasn't treated. But keep that in mind. Foyer treatments also work. But if you're going to use a foyer treatment, you want to make sure you use proper gallonage, enough water or carrier to get, get the insecticide down to the the uh, bugs because that's it has to contact them to kill them and they're behind the leaf sheath or they're right under the soil surface so sometimes that's a little bit difficult they may actually come out of that wheat for a week so if you have an insecticide you know when you spray it it may last three or four days and that plant will grow a little bit so the bottom's not covered with residual insecticide those bugs come along they may feed on it and not get into it again. So keep that in mind. It's it's all a matter of timing. It's a matter of the weather. If we have good growing conditions, which we have had, although the prognosis for the next 10 days doesn't look real good for rain, looks more like heat and sunshine to me, the chinch bugs are on the move. It's Right now, it's a walking generation. So keep that in mind. They'll walk 50 yards, and if they don't find anything, they'll die on their own. So If you can hold off planting sorghum or corn for a little while, I think that walking generation will be passed. Remember, there's another generation, though. A second generation is going to come. Once these find a suitable host, they will develop 28, 40 days, whatever it takes. They will lay eggs, and they'll start it all over again. A lot of times, again, it's all about timing. Again, if if the sorghum is starting to head out at that time, the chinch bugs will feed on that succulent 
kernel developing in the head, and they can do some damage there. We've we've actually had to treat sorghum just as it's heading out early on because of chinch bugs because they can build up. Once that sorghum gets at that point, it's really tough to control them down on along the ground or along the base of the plant because you got you know you got all that foliage there that intercepts the spray and it's just really tough to get to them. They're behind the leaf sheaths. That's where the eggs are. That's where the nymphs are. And that's where the adults are. Or the adults are mating and laying eggs. So once it gets to that point, they're more difficult to control with an insecticide. You know, I always get the question, does insecticide, do they work? They work, but it's just very difficult to get it to where these little bugs are. The chinch bug, remember, the adult can fly. They'll fly from one place to another. The immatures don't. The newly hatched immatures are kind of a, are very small, but they're a reddish, pinkish color. And then they'll develop a gray, then they'll have a gray with little white marks, and they develop into the uh, adult. And that development period right now takes probably, at these temperatures, 20 to 25 days, and then they'll be out laying eggs and moving, spreading out in the field all over again. So that's kind of where we are with chinch bugs right now. Remember, they'll feed on any grass, so that's another reason if you have volunteer wheat next to your wheat field and you're going to plant corn or sorghum into it, mainly sorghum right now, chinch bugs can be on that volunteer wheat just fine. They can build up on that and then move over to the sorghum when that germinates. So just kind of a heads up right now, as the wheat is senescing very quickly, these chinch bugs are moving out, looking for another succulent grass source to uh, feed on. Jeff, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information about chinch bugs right now. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. That was K-State Crop and Demologist Jeff Whitworth. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be right back. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Tuesday show talking about things that wheat growers might be seeing in their field as they're getting ready for wheat harvest or are currently in wheat harvest. And then to talk about it, we're joined by Key State wheat pathologist Kelsey Anderson Onofre. Kelsey, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Kelsey, as we're thinking about wheat harvest, we have received a fair amount of rainfall. And how could that impact harvest besides when producers are able to get into the field? You know, there's a few th- disease problems that can show up right towards the end of our season here, right at harvest. Probably the first one that we'll start to see is are the sooty molds, or sometimes we'll see black point. So this is an issue that, you know, sometimes either when wheat has A, died prematurely, so maybe there was another issue in the field that caused our wheat plants to die a little bit prematurely. Maybe they didn't complete grain fill. Um, Sometimes we see that black discoloration on the outside of the wheat head, and that's typically something we call a sooty mold. So it's a secondary fungi that's kind of just hopping on for a free lunch. That's not really um, a disease. It's, It's just kind of taking advantage of that dead tissue out there. Sometimes we see that same thing happen if we have rainfall events that kind of prevent harvest. So the wheat is close to moisture necessary for harvest, uh, but maybe we have some rainfall that rewets the grain. And, and that's another place where we can see kind of that that black discoloration or some of those black, what we call sooty molds, um, colonizing our, our wheat heads. They can lead to another problem um, sometimes that we call black point. So that's a disease that causes black discoloration, usually near the embryo of the wheat plant, of the um, grain. So after harvest, you may uh, look at your grain and you notice that there's some either black discoloration just at the tip or it sometimes can extend through the grain. Um, It's typically a cosmetic problem, but it is, again, something we see when we get some rainfall uh, just right around that flowering period and 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 flowering um, harvest is actually delayed a little bit. So uh, I know last year we did have some cases of black point in our wheat fields, and and we're suspecting that some of our grain uh, will have that issue again this year. Is it a concern for growers when they take that to the elevator? Um, it shouldn't be. So this is um, uh, something that's typically cosmetic. I think occasionally there can be a, a discount, um, but but that is a a pretty rare thing. Typically, it's just a cosmetic issue. There's nothing we can do to control it, unfortunately. All of our fungicides are, are way past their label date by the time we, we get to the end of harvest. So um, unfortunately, it's something that, and I think there are a couple of varieties that maybe 
tend to get this um, symptom a little bit worse than others, but in general, this is a cosmetic issue. Anything else related to sooty mold that producers should keep in mind? If we do have black point on our wheat, those would be good candidates if we're saving that seed back um, for a fungicide seed treatment, because although they don't cause um, issues late in the season, you know, with the grain, they may cause an issue with seed quality, right? So we want to make sure that those would be candidates for a seed treatment because we might have issues with stand establishment. As we are thinking about our wheat harvest, as some people are there or are getting really close, also keeping in mind common bunt. Another disease that's that we do pick up here at harvest is common bunt. So that's the disease where when we squeeze the kernel, um, a bunch of black spores come out. Um, it can make our grain uh, sometimes grated smutty or lightly smutty. And there's sometimes a foul, fishy odor when we have common bunt in the field. So sometimes you smell it at harvest before you actually see it. In severe cases, we can get discounts or rejections when we see this disease. But it's another one that can be taken care of um, pretty pretty well with with a fungicide seed treatment. So again, those seed treatments can can provide a lot of bang for their buck um, in terms of preventing some of these these, um, seed-borne issues. But again, common bunt, if we have it in our field um, and we do save that seed back for next season planting, we can see kind of more severe common bunt next season. So again, we want to, if we do have common bunt, identify it and make sure we're, we're taking care of our seed appropriately for next season. But no concern with getting it out of the field? Well, harvest should be okay. You know, you might um, consider if you do have severe common bunt, you might consider harvesting that field last just because it will break open those those what we call bunt balls and you can get some contamination of the combine. So if you harvest a field that doesn't have that issue, um, after you harvest a field with severe common bunt, uh, you can have some contamination of those grain lots. So that that would be the only consideration really to think about at harvest. And of course, all of those um, contaminated grains, they will have some yield reduction with associated with with that because you're not actually getting getting the, the complete grain fill in those cases. And one other thing wheat growers might be seeing in their fields as they enter them with their combine, head blight? Head blight, yeah. So there probably are some parts of the state that saw head blight this year. Uh, you would have seen symptoms just before wheat wheat starts to, to mature. So we'll go out and see those spikes that are maybe half um, white or have some pink spore discoloration on the outside. Those are our telltale signs. But sometimes we don't catch it. So our really our only signal is when we harvest, we start to see grain that's what we call lightweight or chalky. We have maybe some pink discoloration. Those are our telltale signs that we had head blight. Occasionally we'll, um, you know, we'll actually find out when we get our sample tested for the toxin called deoxynovalanol or DON uh, when we're taking it in uh, to the elevator. So that that's something to watch out for this year. If you do have um, some some seed that's contaminated with scab with fusarium head blight, again we we probably want to harvest those sooner rather than later because dawn can get more severe the longer that grain sits in the field. Um, so if you you know harvest that last, you can get those dawn levels that start to creep up a bit more. And those seed, those lots, um, if you're saving them for seed, might be good candidates, again, for a fungicide seed treatment. There's a lot of good research from K-State that shows that those um, fungicide seed treatments can really improve stand establishment if we have a seed lot that had scab or head blight. So, again, that's just another thing we need to be watching for here uh, towards the end of the season. It's it's much too late to make a decision to apply a fungicide, um, but we can, you know, think about how we handle that that grain or that seed uh, here after harvest. Are any of these something that we need to be concerned about for next year or it's just luck of the draw whether it's going to happen to you each year? So when we're thinking about planning for next year, there are some considerations here. So if we have, again, if we're saving back our seed from any of these seed lots um, for common bunt, we would uh, potentially want to apply a seed treatment because we could have issues with more common bunt next season. So that's only an issue if we're saving our seed. We're not really worried about it surviving in the soil. Um, For scab and for, for black point, we really are most concerned with saving back our seed 
and having some reduced stand establishments, we can have some damping off or some loss of stand, lo lower germination if we don't apply a fungicide seed treatment in those cases. If you did have a scab outbreak this year, you know, now's a good time to do some planning for next season. So if we're planting back into corn stubble, for example, and we know uh, we have a variety that's maybe on the more susceptible side, it's now the time to start to put together a plan uh, for maybe next year applying a, a flowering fungicide application, right? So it's just time to start evaluating what happened this season and maybe planning a variety with a little better um, resistance or potentially going in and, and planning on that flowering fungicide application if we have um, the suitable weather in that that flowering window. Again, scab is really a problem when we have high humidity and some rainfall right around that, that flowering period. That's the most important time for infection and also for that fungicide application. Kelsey, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some things that wheat growers might be seeing in their fields. Thanks for having me. That was Kansas State University wheat pathologist Kelsey Anderson Onafre. If you'd like to keep up to date with the wheat harvest in Kansas, a great way to do that is to follow along with Kansas Wheat. You can follow along on their website at kansaswheat.org or on their social media. Before we cut to a break, I would like to make you aware of some upcoming public meetings that will be taking place to seek input on Kansas water priorities and investments. These will be regional conversations scheduled to help develop statewide investment program for the Kansas Water Plan implementation. The Kansas Water Office, Kansas Department of Agriculture, and Kansas Department of Health and Environment are holding a series of local consult workshops to discuss implementation of the 2022 Kansas Water Plan. You are being invited to join the conversation and share your thoughts on regional water needs, priorities and recommendations for funding, policy changes, ways to improve state capacity and water management, effectiveness of programs, and measurable goals and timelines. There are six regional meetings taking place. The first one in the northwest corner on June 17th from 5 to 8 p.m., after that, in the southwest corner, it's June 18th from 9 to noon. After that, then, in the southeast corner, we have June 20th from 2 to 5 p.m. Following that, we have the south central on June 25th from 9 to noon. And then on June 26th, we have the north central Kansas from 9 to noon. And the last one is northeast Kansas on June 27th from 9 to noon. I will put a link in today's show notes on agtoday.net where you can RSVP and there will also be a link if you have any questions about the workshops. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's milk lines. June is dairy month, and that typically means hosting events at the farm to show product and explain the process for making these products. With the current HPI situation, though, producers will probably want to avoid bringing large groups onto the farm. K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook has several ideas for safely celebrating dairy month such as providing snacks to area sports teams and 4-H clubs or using social media to tell your dairy story. Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning June is Dairy Month. Yes, it's that time of year again. We're in the season for Dairy Month. And as we think about the celebrations that we normally have around Dairy Month, we might want to make some changes on what we do on our dairy farms. This is largely due to the fact that if we're practicing biosecurity measures in association with the HPAI situation in our industry, we probably really don't want to invite a lot of people onto our farms. So if that is the case, if you've had an open house maybe in the past to celebrate Dairy Month where you've actually invited the general public in, that may not be something that you want to do this year for various reasons. So what other choices do you have? Well, actually, there's a ton of very good things you can do to celebrate Dairy Month with your community. And here's just a few suggestions that you might want to check out in your local community. First, 
There's generally little league going on in most of our communities. So those teams, you could provide some snacks after a practice, maybe like chocolate milk or string cheese, or maybe do something after a game for some of your little league teams in your area. This is a great way to share some dairy product that is very nutritious with young people as well as explain a little bit about what you do on your dairy farm. In addition to this, there's also generally basketball camps and other uh, sports camps within your local community associated with your schools. You could visit with the coaches, see if there's an opportunity to provide some nutritious dairy snacks for the end of practice, and also an opportunity to explain a little bit about what you do on your dairy farm. In many of our communities, there's wineries, so you might want to pair up with a local winery and do a cheese and wine tasting at the winery. That way you're not inviting people just directly onto your farm. You can explain your impact with uh, consumers concerning what you do every day to keep milk safe and wholesome for dairy products. You may want to invite a few of your close friends to share your dairy, and that would probably be okay. If you do something like this, you might want to minimize actual contact with animals and still give you an opportunity to share your dairy farm with those that are maybe closest to you rather than opening up to the general public. Now, here's some other things that can happen as well. How about social media? Maybe you have children in the family that are more adept at getting these things published than you might be. So get your children involved. They can show what life is like on the dairy. This can be part of your celebration of June as Dairy Month. Some other things that we can do is keep in mind that you have 4-H groups that are meeting throughout the summer or maybe Uh, other local clubs or maybe something at church that you can sponsor an ice cream social for or provide some nutritious dairy snacks to your local 4-H club for one of their meetings. And then finally, another thing you might want to consider is if you have a local cafe in the neighborhood, you might want to consider working with them to somehow emphasize grilled cheese sandwiches Maybe you partially sponsor the cost of grilled cheese sandwiches one day, and that reduces the uh, cost to consumers. And during that time, maybe you can explain a little bit about what you do on your local dairy farm and how dairy products are important to a healthy lifestyle. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy producers to consider various ways to celebrate Juna's Dairy Month as we celebrate our great dairy industry. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.